Good morning, and thank you for joining the 10th Annual Tribal Healing to Wellness Court Virtual Enhancement Training. You have joined session E1, titled Tribal State Collaborations, Transfer Agreements, Joint Jurisdiction, Qu Courts, and Beyond, presented by our, our dear friend, Lauren and Suzanne Garcia. My name is Christina Pacheco with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. I am a Tribal Healing to Wellness Court Specialist. I'm joined by Janice Thompson. Janice? Thank you, Chris. Again, thank you for joining us. I will now turn it back over to today's presenters to begin. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Suzanne Garcia with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. Um, I am a tribal legal and child welfare specialist. Um, and my co-presenter is Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren Van Schilfgaard here. I am honored to have formally been affiliated with the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, but I call now wearing the director's hat for the Tribal Legal Development Clinic of the UCLA School of Law, where I am still privileged to be working with uh, tribal governments uh, on a variety of different uh, nation building products, um, including healing the wellness courts. Excellent. So today, oh, here's us. Here's us. Here we are. <laughs> okay. Um, so today, I think we're we're trying to, you know, spark ideas of what kind of collaborations are possible, and we're going to be doing that first by kind of framing the issue about some of the mechanics on collaborations. You know, structurally, what different kinds of collaborations kind of look like. Um, and we're going to use that to frame a conversation about um, some examples that tribal healing to wellness courts um, have collaborations that they've entered into with their state and their local partners. Because what we really would like to do, and it's, it's a little difficult because we're not in place, is to have a discussion with you. We really want you to fire up the chat box and the question and answer box. Um, to talk about what kind of collaborations you're into right now, which ones you think might be helpful, might help you serve the families more effectively, um, and what kind of support we can provide to help you make those happen. Um, yeah, you made me realize we kind of jumped in and it's Friday morning. Uh, it's certainly here early here on the West Coast. I uh, recognize that many of you are fortunate to have already had your morning coffee, but I just wanted to acknowledge whatever space um, you're in right now uh, and honor the indigenous people um, for whose land you are currently sitting on. Uh, I have the honor of being on the land of the Tongva Gambrelino people and the Fernandino Tataviam. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge them and thank them for sharing their space with me this morning. Um, I also wanted to give a, a larger introduction. I am um, a member of Coach de Pueblo and grew up in Albuquerque, um, but I am calling now from Burbank, California, and just wanted to acknowledge what a time it is to be alive in this country and the fact that we are um, experiencing a lot of different things right now. My phone's blowing up about our current like executive branch and all of the troubles that they are encountering this hour. Um, but also to acknowledge you uh, and the fact that you are participating in this conference, albeit virtually, um, speaks uh, volumes for your commitment to your tribal community, to your role, to your participants. Uh, and I am personally, but I think I can also speak on behalf of Suzanne, excited to engage in, I think, what is a really fascinating intersection uh, philosophically, um, like, you know, uh, legally uh, in legal theory, but also like how practical application of people coming together, just trying to make it work and actually in the process, innovating something that is better than the sum of its parts. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the Aboriginal homelands of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California and talk about collaboration. Um, they collaborate oftentimes with two states and three counties. Pleasure to be calling in from here. Thank you. Hey, Judge Maldonado. See you in the chat. I'm going to try and like do both. Anyways, next slide. I'm controlling the slides. Here we go. So we did, we wanted to kind of move into this by, you know, thinking about why collaborate generally. Um, 
um, as we all know that tribal jurisdiction has been limited by the Supreme Court um, and the resulting lay of the land is extremely complex. You know, you can have cases that could possibly be heard in multiple jurisdictions and might start off in multiple jurisdictions. You've got um, families and participants that might have cases in different jurisdictions. They might be interacting with different service providers who hopefully are providing complementary services, but sometimes they might, families can have a choice of what kind of services they provide. Um, and, you know, funding streams um, for those services can often be tied to um, one jurisdiction or another. Um, I work with a lot of child welfare and for a lot of, if you're, we're working with the family and we wanna see the resource family that's taking care of a child, um, get financial support and other supports to take care of that child, we were hoping to get them some Title IV-E funding, um, foster care funding, but a lot of times that is linked in with the state court order. You have to have a state court order to trigger that. Um, so that's another reason to collaborate. And finally, last but not least, um, we all know that the state and local agencies can't provide the culturally, often can't provide the culturally um, grounded services that the tribes can. And so that's another very important reason to collaborate. So just literally yesterday, we were um, reached out to regarding a state court training for the state court judges there. And uh, one of a, a person was like, well, I don't really understand why the state court judges need to learn about tribal jurisdiction. Like, shouldn't they already know about that since they're state court judges? And it was like, ha ha ha. Like, you live in a wonderful make-believe world that I want to live in. That's not like what's happening. Uh, jurisdiction is so complicated, but then you couple that with the fact that nobody even knows like that it's an issue, much less that it is incredibly complex. And so uh, why collaborate? A, because it's really complex and hard, but B, because there is a significant learning curve that needs to be overcome. And just because like the rule of law says something on paper, which is already heavily contextualized in a long and arduous history of colonization, but B, people don't even understand it and misapply it. And, and it's our job to hold people accountable. And so collaboration, I think, is just one tool in the toolbox of expressing and protecting sovereignty. Agreed. It was fun though. Um, so like I said, it is, it is our job to do it. Um, but I also, um, I have been circling and privileged to work with a lot of people, including Suzanne, who have really been circling and emphasizing this idea that collaboration is not just a matter of promoting sovereignty, it's our responsibility to provide for our community. I know, especially, you know, like trained as a, a legal warrior, right? Like it's this like go out and, you know, defend tribal sovereignty to like the ends of the earth, which yes. Um, but tribal governments um, are, as governments, have extensive responsibilities to act like a government, including internally, for community members. And I really, like I said, I've been really toying with this idea um, in trying to express and like articulate what some of the distinctions are between a quote westernized worldview and a quote, you know, pan-Indian uh, worldview. Uh, and I think at least a very generalized, overly generalized expression of that is the idea that in the westernized view, we identify ourselves as individuals who have rights in opposition to the government. And, and the government has to respect those rights, even though it's constantly trying to claw and, and, and abuse those rights. Whereas within an indigenous framework, 
our relationship is not so much defined as an individual, but as a community member. And yes, I am my own person, but my identity is contingent upon my relations to each other. And yes, I have rights as an individual, but it makes less sense articulating it those as individual rights and more as the responsibilities that I owe to my fellow community members and their rights as expressed in the fulfillment of my responsibilities towards them. And so similarly, the government has authority to exercise jurisdiction, but that authority is only relevant when it's expressed in serving the community. And so I really have uh, you know, gained hope and optimism, especially in this particular year, uh, but I really see wellness courts as a beacon of that hope and the wellness court model in and of itself is a model of collaboration. Right? It's identifying the failures of the adversarial system, but rather than like completely burning it to the ground, which wouldn't be crazy, uh, it picks <laughs> up the pieces that are useful and builds a uh, functional, healthy uh, collaborative. And so co interjurisdictional collaboration is merely an extension of the wellness court model in its most basic form. Okay, so teeing up why collaborate within wellness court specifically well we're here at the you know enhancement training specifically devoted to wellness courts so we're obviously going to focus on wellness courts um i think that it uh should be noted that interjurisdictional collaboration is not exclusive to wellness courts there is lots of collaboration in fact what we've learned in looking at this collaboration is that wellness courts frequently are the catalyst for other types of interjurisdictional collaboration it's sort of the the blessing that like you can do this look it works great let's go look in all of these other areas but I think there is something about the fact that wellness courts are jurisdiction in their bones that makes them particularly ripe for this type of area. The individuals that tend to practice within a wellness court have already, you know, we talk about this and it's like super dark, but like have drunk the Kool-Aid, right? Have, have our buy into the model. And so the idea of being innovative, of redefining what a typical role is, reconceiving of what a relationship between jurisdictions can and should be and those are already the people that tend to like be gravitate towards wellness courts so it's not crazy but there's also benefits to, specific to the wellness court that i think should really be considered when it, uh, contemplating whether or not an interjurisdictional collaboration might be right for you and your neighbors um, there's a couple low-hanging fruits, right? Just sheer practicality of resources. Do we have an inpatient uh, treatment center uh, in our tribal community? Maybe our neighbors do. Do we have enough probation officers to be providing uh, meaningful supervision? Do we have like physically enough drug tests? Do are our drug tests located in a geographically convenient area for our participants? Or is there something closer to where they reside that might you know, benefit from us calling, you know, picking up the phone and working on a collaboration with our neighboring hospital? Um, there's a couple of, like those I think are like the real quick, like literally I can pick up the phone and like facilitate this collaboration in about 10 minutes. There's more complex, collaborations that require a little bit more facilitation that I think we'll be exploring into, specifically those types of legal collaborations, right? Where I have a triggering offense in one jurisdiction and I'm proposing to transfer or duplicate that case in another jurisdiction. Um, did you want to comment on some of these, Suzanne? It, you know, what you were talking about, you know, um, Proximity to services, I think that's a that's a really key one um, because part of part of our being doing our work in a trauma informed way <clears throat> is allowing our participants and our families choice and voice in the services that they use that they think are going to fit their needs the best. Um, and by entering into collaboration, we can help amplify their voice. 
and give them that choice. You know, instead of, okay, here's the provider, go see him. It's, okay, we've got all these providers. You know, who would you like to work with? Um, really empower the family and really empower the participants. We're gonna talk about uh, quite a few of these examples in some of our case studies in this presentation, but I wanted to draw attention to just one bullet point at the top of the second column, the increased funding opportunities. I've seen a couple places already leverage this, um, like specifically applying to DOJ grants uh, as a, a collaborative, so that there's not just one like applying entity, they're applying as a you know county tribal court that is like already a jurisdiction. There's clearly like advantages and disadvantages to doing that, right? Logistically, nightmare. Oh my gosh, putting a grant together is already ridiculous. And now you're going to have to like collaborate with twice as many providers and like four times as much bureaucracy. Oh, good luck. Advantage, if you can actually pull it off, it is um, a really impressive looking proposal where you're, you, you've already exemplified in just the sheer ability to put this application together to the potential funders that not only are you proposing right to leverage services and provide this like, you know, innovative model, but you clearly work well together. There's like no other way to show that like we can collaborate than the fact that we pulled off putting this application together. It's not always all roses. I've also seen collaborations like not make it because of that. And I think that that's okay, right? Like we all know, especially, you know, wellness courts have been at it for a couple decades now. Sometimes they come and go. The fact that the wellness court, uh, you know, didn't survive for 20 years doesn't mean that there wasn't good work put into that wellness court. And it doesn't mean that they can't revive a wellness court in the future, right? Wellness courts are supposed to be specifically designed to respond to the community's needs as they are right now. Those, those needs change and it's okay for the wellness court to change too. So I say that, that like, it's not always gonna be perfect, but it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting idea. One last thing is that especially in the healing to wellness court, kind of where you have a lot of different partners sitting at the table, it's gonna be completely reasonable and understandable and to be expected that you might have a great collaborative relationship with one department and your relationship with a different department might not be as strong as you'd like. That's to be expected. And I don't think is reason for too much concern because it's all about building relationships and building relationships takes time. And just a friendly logistical reminder of our own, um, Janice and Chris are on the call with here with us now. Um, so feel free if you have questions that, you know, come to you during the course of the presentation, feel free to throw them in. We can answer them now. We can answer them at the end of the uh, presentation. This is for you. And so feel free to take ownership. All right. So this is just, this slide is kind of to frame the conversation quickly, there's a lot of different kinds of collaboration um, and none are particularly better than others. It just depends on what works for your system, how you can best serve your families, the kind of context you're working in. I've seen some great informal collaborations. Um, that is just some, you know, two people picking up the phone and, okay, how are we gonna do this? And it's on a case by case basis. And next thing you know, they kind of have a system for how they do things and they never put it in writing. And it works just fine for the system and for you know, the context within their working. Um, I've been part of, I've helped negotiate broad, really broad MOUs The you know, we're going to work together. Um, and again, I work in the child welfare field a lot. So um, we're gonna work together because both sovereigns agree that, um, and support the idea that um, children are the tribe's most precious resource. You know, you get the county to put that in paper, that's very empowering. Um, and also that they agree that the Indian Child Welfare Act needs to be enforced properly. And then, you know, some jurisdictions like to enter into really detailed MOUs. You know, you're going to do this and I'm going to do that, all the way down to formal protocols. So again, none of these is any better than any others. It just really depends on what works for you in the context within your working. There's benefits um, and disadvantages for 
um, all those different kinds of you know collaborations. So the informal ones, they're really efficient. They're really quick. You know, they can adapt to different situations, different cases. If you have a situation come up that no one ever anticipated, if you have an informal collaboration, everyone's just going to get together and put their heads together to figure out how to solve the problem. Um, those kind of informal collaborations work really well with that. Um, if you don't have the time, like, you know, or the resources to put together a really nice formal written piece of paper, um, that's another reason why sometimes these collaborations stay informal. Also, you know, if it's especially lower level where you don't need a lot of legislative or executive approval from tribal council, these kind of informal collaborations can really work. Um, and they're a really great stepping stone. If you want to move to something more complex and more formal, these kind of informal collaborations are a great stepping stone to kind of build those relationships that then turn into something bigger. And we have some examples of that that we're gonna talk about later on. The disadvantage with these informal collaborations is that sometimes they're staff dependent. They're really driven by two different personalities. So when you have staff turnover, all of the institutional knowledge kind of disappears with those staff and it can be hard to rebuild that. If you have new staff come in and they don't want to um, collaborate the way that you used to, so you have different staff come in from a different, you know, the other jurisdiction, you don't have an enforcement mechanism. You don't have a piece of paper to come back and say, no, you know, our, our sovereign said that this is how we're gonna work together. Um, and so that can make the collaboration kind of disappear. They can be difficult to apply if you have a really complex issue with a lot of different stakeholders. Those kinds of situations um, do better when you have a formal writing. When you don't have something written down, I, I, one of the places I work, council, all they would ask me is, did you follow the protocol? We had gotten to the point where they wouldn't ask about the specifics of a case. All they wanted to know is whether or not we followed protocol because they didn't want to step into how we were working and how we worked with a specific family. They just wanted to make sure that we were following the protocol. Um, so when someone complained to them, they could say, we looked into it, they followed protocol, but they didn't want to get into the details of the case. If you don't have something written down and one family is possibly treated differently from another family, it can look like unfair. Um, and that can cause a lot of problems as we all know. Um, so informal collaboration, sometimes are, they can be difficult because of that. And finally, these informal collaborations are really good when you have a small team, but when you get to a bigger team, um, it kind of limits their buy-in and their role in it. So that's another reason where informal collaborations might not work so well if you have a bigger team. Lauren, did you want to weigh in on any of that? I thought that was beautiful. My, my, my mind was drifting to um, how it's um, actually really, depending on the context, I don't want to say it's always easy, but I found that it takes not that much time to um, shift position, right? It's like always, I'm thinking about at the law school, right? We, um, I wanted to, uh, I had some extra funds, and so I wanted to take some law students to the NIJA conference so that they could see tribal court practitioners in all of their glory and, and how important that was. And so last year, I, you know, took them, and it was sort of kind of a big deal, and da-da-da-da. Uh, and then, you know, the, the following semester is like, well, here's this other Indian law conference. Like, I know we don't normally do this, but we're going to go do this now because I think it's really important that you go to tribal land and see tribal practitioners doing their thing. And then this year, granted it's, you know, COVID and blah, 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 but they were talking about, it's like, well, every year we have to go to this conference and go see these things. So we need to start fundraising. And in just the course of like a couple months, they were talking about it as if this was a thing that we always do. And so we need to like make space for it. And like, how are we going to pull it off this year? And just how quickly the conversation had switched from like we're trying this new thing let's see if it works to this is how we're doing it now like come on everybody like like this is how we've always done it and so I realize that's like 
not like a monumental shift and you know lots of like privilege and funding was going into that but my point is just like the shift in mentality that uh you know it's like ooh, i feel like like i'm like changing the entire like way that we think about things to like this is how we do things now um it can just as easily switch right like these are just like certain mind shifts and those students are gonna graduate and go on and we're gonna get a whole new batch of students with a whole new thought process for how we should be approaching things. And for better, or for worse, that's pretty much how the turnover works in Healing the Wellness Court. There's a pretty regular flow of new uh, staff members coming and going. And so there is constantly work to, uh, you know, get collective buy-in for what we're doing. And then always all of these micro shifts, sometimes macro shifts, lots and lots of micro shifts of like how we're doing things. And so informal collaborations are really easy to like sneak in, sneak in of like, here's what we're going to be doing now. It's like, this is how we've always done it. I swear. <laughs> were you going to handle this one or was I? I forgot. I'm gonna let you do it and then I promise I'll take over. Got it, got it. Um, so with formal collaborations, they're great because roles and responsibilities can really be clearly defined. Um, and so when there's turnover or as often happens, we have a lot on our plate. I forgot who did what, you know, you have it written down. Um, you kind of have a roadmap for how things are done. Um, and it also it allows for increased accountability, you know, it's, when you have a formal agreement and everyone signed on to, um, if someone is maybe not holding up their end, you can, you know, you can have a conversation about that and, and find out what supports they might need to, to bring them back into, you know, fulfilling the role that they said they were going to. Obviously survives staff turnover and these formal agreements are also a really good way to onboard new staff. Um, when you have a piece of paper, you know, okay, this is how we do things here. If you have any questions, let me know. Let's go through this. And for the participants, they can really increase the perception of fairness, right? This is how this court does things. This is how you can expect to be treated. It really increases that kind of transparency. Um, and that's another tenet of trauma-informed practice and doing this kind of work is everybody knows how things are done and it's fair. And it really gives, so another thing about these formal agreements is it really gives time to be thoughtful about how to marshal all of the resources from each partner. And finally, last but not least, um, there's a lot of different models out there. Also, there's a lot, so there's a lot of models to, to draw from. This, this bullet is kind of, I see it kind of going two different ways. So, so there's a lot of models that you can look at to put together your formal agreement. Um, but it also is a way to express, you know, you're actually the verb model, you're modeling the collaboration between the agencies and the government. Where formal agreements are kind of disadvantage is the time it takes to put them together can seem daunting because you just want to get together and do the work, right? You just want to do the work and all of the planning meetings and the, you know, the considering what kind of wording you want to use and all of that. Um, can really slow you down and when you really just want to get in there and serve the families. Depending on how they're written and depending on how your partners um, do their business, they can be very rigid. You know, I've, there's different kind of people who look at rules differently. Some of them look at them as, okay, how can we stay true to this rule and still assist this family in their road to healing? And some of them are like, nope, sorry, this is the way things are. So they can be very rigidly applied and sometimes to not, not to the benefit of the family. Liability concerns when you've got something in writing, this is what we said we were gonna do, this is how we said we were going to do it, you know, so there's liability concerns that, that can be brought in on that. And also when you have, when you go, when you take all of the trouble of planning and writing and getting things signed, getting a formal agreement signed, and things don't work out the way you would hope they would, um, that can really take the wind out of a lot of people's sails. And it can make it more difficult to get people engaged in developing a new or better formal agreement. Lauren, did you want to weigh in on any of that? No, I'm going to go to the next slide because we're going to talk about major considerations. Okay. So 
Suzanne made it sound like people don't like lawyers. And that's obviously not true. I know you all love lawyers. Uh, <laughs> and if it's not obvious, I trained as a lawyer. Uh, and so this is really where I think things shine, in part because when somebody tells me about tribal state collaboration in a wellness court, sort of the default place that I go to is the instance in which a tribal member, but for colonization, right, misbehaved and the tribe would be there to correct their behavior, not just because they are harming the community, but because they're harming themselves, they're harming their family, everything's out of whack, and we all need to come together to rectify this situation. But colonization did happen, is happening, and a huge byproduct of that, amongst many, right, is the loss of tribal jurisdiction, including criminal jurisdiction, to assert over this instance. Instead, mostly the state, but of course this all depends, peel to weighty, da 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 da, mostly the state is there exercising the jurisdiction because say this happened in the urban area. And so the state is processing this case. The tribe clearly still has an interest in this individual. They also likely have culturally relevant services and uh, supervision and resources and family services that would greatly benefit this participant. And so through a formal agreement, we can transfer the case from the state to the tribe for purposes of utilizing the Healing to Wellness Court. Now with that transfer, there's lots of like legal concerns, right? And I think we, that we should be attentive to those concerns. The, we talk about the complexities between jurisdiction uh, and they are, they're very complex. There's also like a power dynamic going on here between the state and the tribes. And, and, I, and I think that we shouldn't ignore that. And we should be very cautious about the potential for the state to really put off a lot of their obligations to pay for these services onto the tribes because the tribes have an interest in serving their members. We also should be attentive to what authority is being transferred with this case. Is it meaningful if the tribe is going to take on this participant, provide all of the supervision, but not have the authority to issue something like a sanction without asking permission from the state? Or even the authority to terminate the participant if it's not working out? Or the authority to say, yes, they did everything that we asked. We're recommending graduation. We want to award graduation. And with that graduation, we want to ensure that this participant enjoys all of the legal benefits, including avoiding prosecution or having their sentence deferred or having their record expunged, right? Those are all things that I think we need to consider when we're entertaining a uh, transfer of the docket. We, it's not just this participant, right? This, imp this impacts the whole tribal judiciary. This is an opportunity to highlight the great work that the judiciary is doing, but also reinforce that this is a court with authority and that needs to be recognized by our state partners. It could also go the reverse way. There's lots of ways that cases can come in. It doesn't have to be criminal. It can be family, it can be child welfare, it can be juvenile delinquency, right? So I'm using like a default criminal justice vocabulary, um, but I think, you know, if interested, we could expand on this in a lot of different varieties. So some of the considerations, and I think these are just some, but here's some big ones, right? Is how is the case coming into the tribal court? pre-post adjudication. I note equal protection here. The tribal entry points may not mirror the state entry points. The tribe may be operating a pre-adjudication. People are coming in here before there's actually been a trial and a guilty plea, um, whereas the state might be operating a post-adjudication. So does that mean that a tribal participant who was arrested on state land is gonna have like different leverage points than participants that entered via tribal jurisdiction. Not, not a fatal difference, but something to consider. Um, 
retention of the carrot and stick, by that I mean what, a, what leverage will the tribal court have to issue things like incentives and sanctions. Um, lots of healing well to wellness courts offer self-referrals, people to just opt in despite the lack of a case trigger. But with that, it gets tricky that if like, if I sanction you, you can't just say that like, you don't wanna do it and quit, right? Because the people that are here with a post adjudication case hanging over their head, they have more leverage to stay because the sanction is still better than actually being convicted and going to jail. Coordination between attorneys. If they have a public defender on the state side, will that public defender follow them into tribal court? Will a new public defender be assigned in tribal court? Does the tribal court even have a public defender to assign? Maybe we don't need a public defender on the week to week healing to wellness court meetings, but we still need to maintain a line of communication so that their public defender knows what's going on. Do we have any ability to ensure that that's gonna take place. Uh, how's the public defender getting paid? Will the state continue to pay their fees while they're in healing to wellness court? Again, nothing fatal, but quite good questions to ask. What triggers a referral? By here, I really mean, does the tribe and the state have a mechanism wherein the tribe is notified when tribal members are arrested or uh, um, prosecuted? I know some tribes actively monitor their own tribal members. That's like a crazy resource that the tribe is providing that is very like sophisticated data wise. And I don't think very many tribes have that capacity. On the other hand, you know, the tribes are a separate sovereign from the state. And so they don't have ability to monitor the arrest records. We're really depending on the state to notify us. Does the state even ask about tribal affiliation? Do they even have the capacity to say how many tribal members are in custody right now? Uh, what are the probation requirements going to look like? Does the tribe have the authority to provide this level of supervision? As we'll explore in some of the case studies, some tribes actually um, will collaborate just for supervision. The case is going to stay in the state. It's going to be, you know, there's gonna, not going to be a docket transfer, but the tribe is going to provide the service of probation, like drug testing, discharge, who gets to say um, when there's graduation, when there's termination, and what the legal um, consequences are of that. Uh, incentives and sanctions, as I mentioned. And finally, communication. Communication, we did a presentation last year, I think, on just communication. It is so tricky internally amongst tribal agencies. And like, newsflash, states suffer with the exact same debilitating communication systems. And so now we're proposing to introduce another layer of interjurisdiction collaboration. The truth is some agencies are good at it and some are bad at it. And there does not seem to be like a magic difference between tribal and state, um, but it's definitely something that's going to need to be figured out. And I have found, at least in my anecdotal experience, people that are not particularly interested in making this collaboration work will frequently lean on communication problems as the reason why it's not going to work. And so communication is definitely like a, a nice uh, blame game um, for why something might not work. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Suzanne? Oh, I was just thinking, you know, in, in my defense, um, <laughs> Lawyers can be a huge help. They can also, they can also, especially in the family court context, family healing to wellness court context, where a, where a parent's rights to their child um, are so important, they can come in and with their zealous advocacy and, you know, don't talk to anyone unless I'm in the room. And um, so we can be a huge help and we can also be a huge hindrance, depending, depending on how the attorneys are trained. Um, and what their bent is, whether they're more collaborative or they just like to come in, um, like everything's a boxing match. The, uh, right, the stereotype may or may not be warranted. All right, the time is like, I don't know what time is doing, but it is like slipping by me. So I'm gonna start running through here and going a little bit faster. So along that like, you know, temptation not to be linear, but like here's a linear framework, we have categorized some of these case studies into minimal cooperation, 
full cooperation, collaboration, and co-creation. There's lots of over overlap. A lot of these models don't necessarily neatly fit into the bucket that we've categorized them, but this is just one way of thinking about it. So minimal collaboration, I feel like this is all the low hanging fruit that especially if you've been sort of hungry for an opportunity to go meet your neighbor, here are some ideas that other tribes have implemented that proved to be really successful. Just doing a uh, court observation of your neighbor, everyone likes to be flattered when asked like, you're doing such a great job, can we just watch you do your good work? That feels good. It's also a really nice opportunity to actually go see how they do it and so that you know when your participants are seeing both jurisdictions, you're able to visualize the courtroom that they're describing, the service providers that they're interacting with, the process that they're having to navigate. Pueblo of Laguna actually hosts healing to wellness court teams and they travel from all over the country to come see them. This is something that you could go participate in or develop for yourself that you actively want to assist other tribes in developing their own healing to wellness court. A number of tribes have set up naloxone trainings, particularly those facing uh, epidemic opioid levels, um, and they open it up to the community, Indian and non-Indian. All the service providers here, like, come on down, we're doing a naloxone training. Lots of great meeting, uh, meet and greets were happening there. Uh, this picture was actually taken at the Northern Michigan Tribal Healing to Wellness Court training. This was a super fun idea where a tribe had reached out to the Tribal Law and Policy Institute requesting a training. And it was like, sure, you know, while we're up there, if you have any other courts that you want to invite, like, feel free to invite them. It turned into this whole thing where they had invited, like, seven different tribes, as well as a number of different counties. A couple county providers ended up providing the training sessions, and it was this huge, like, regional training that developed really organically about sharing training resources, but turned into an inter-jurisdiction uh, um, sort of exchange of ideas. Oh, and finally, another naloxone training. I think this is back to you, Suzanne. Yep. So, so next we're going to talk about uh, jurisdictions that are fully cooperating with each other. Um, so Yurok is a really great example. Um, so they're cooperating with two counties, um, Humboldt County and Del Norte County, um, for nonviolent criminal cases and juvenile delinquency cases um, for supervision and for services. Um, Humboldt County is very different from Del Norte County. Um, so, of course, the collaborations look a little bit different, but basically, um, in Humboldt County, um, they will do joint supervision. Um, participants can opt to join the Healing to Wellness Court as part of their, um, part of their probation, um, and those cases are going really well. Um, this has led to a lot of important relationship building. Um, and they basically do joint juristic, uh, joint supervision. Dunlark County is a little bit different. They also do the juvenile cases. Um, and with the adult cases, the county notifies Xerox so the cases can be diverted to the tribal court um, where they screen them for the eligibility and wellness court. Now, this is in the context of a public law 280 state. Um, and so that kind of drives what some of the, some of the agreements, some of the cooperation looks like. Hockey, I think that was you. Responding to the question in the text box. We'll see if that's a sufficient answer. Happy to talk more about Salty Girls. So Pueblo of Pewaukee, um, pretty straightforward. They're operating a very high capacity healing to wellness court, like 40 participants, which is super cool. All of you should be taking notes. Most wellness courts have much fewer participants. That's mostly driven by the capacity of your service providers. Um, but because of the location where Pueblo of Pewaukee is located, which is about halfway between Santa Fe and Taos, I guess it's a little bit closer to Santa Fe, there's a number of different Pueblos that are really in close proximity, but don't have a healing to wellness court. So Pueblo of Pewaukee has sort of opened itself up as like, if you're tribal in the area, 
uh, other courts, you can transfer your tribal member to our wellness court. We're not, you know, Santa Clara, we're not Tasuki, but we do offer some culturally appropriate services that at least might be more relevant than what Santa Fe or Española is offering. Um, so they provide those services up to the other tribes, which is sort of a neat, I have a feeling that this is happening in lots of other places too, but this is the first uh, inter-jurisdictional collaboration I saw between multiple tribes, not just between like a tribe and a county or a municipality that I thought was cool. They've also got a couple of other neat things. Um, I just wanted to highlight that sober living apartment stuff. That was a grant that they had written for CTAS of, uh, I think it was CTAS Purpose Area 3 of like, hey DOJ, we want money and like you setting up this money, this like, you know, $100,000 grant, we're going to use that money to pay rent at the like local apartment building, which happens to be right across the street from the police department. Uh, and it's going to be reserved for healing to wellness court participants, those that do not have reliable housing. So long as they are enrolled in the healing to wellness court, they can live in this apartment building. They'll probably have a roommate, which is another healing to wellness court participant. Pros and cons there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The fact that it is in such close proximity to um, the tribal police as well as the court has proven to be um, really successful, but it's more of like an, an option that if your current living conditions are not safe, uh, there's something here for you. And I thought that was just a creative way to use um, CTAS. This is, that was a huge example of an informal collaboration. They don't have anything in writing. It's just, you know, if, if Their probation officer is like magic on the phone. Yeah. Um, she is a go-getter and was just like, I heard this person got arrested. Like, send them over. I'll be expecting them. It's like, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is actually not a um, actual quartz. This is just a sample, um, but it's kind of a big deal because it came out of the Nos National Conference of um, Supreme Court Justices. I forget what their title is, um, but these were all state court judges. They had reached out to the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, um, and it was basically one of those like, hey, we heard that there are tribal courts. And so I was like, yeah, there are totally tribal courts. While you're here, you know, one of the things that the opioid crisis, unfortunately, like the COVID crisis, has really highlighted is our vulnerabilities. All of our populations that were already vulnerable were the first to be struck by these crises. Um, and so, like, that's where we know where to target our resources. And tribal courts are there ready to provide services. They just need to be enabled with the jurisdictional authority to do so. And so the sample MOU, um, which is available here, you can click on it, it's um, URL. It's also available on wellnesscourts.org on the wellness collaborations webpage. Um, and so this is sort of a state appellate court endorsed MOU uh, merely for the purposes of providing some sample language, but I think also cover that like this isn't some crazy idea that some you know hippies and the training on Friday were promoting like actual state court judges think that it's a good idea too. You're talking about collaborations where um, the jurisdictions actually work together. It's not that they're each staying in their own lane um, and kind of working together. This is where they actually kind of weave services and projects together. Should I talk about Chickasaw? Um, Okay, so I'll get it started. Yeah, so this is, a, I think, a great example of when we talked about how some of those smaller informal collaborations can end up in something that's much more formal um, and much bigger with the tribe stepping forward and taking um, and building a huge, wonderful, beautiful program. Um, and I think they presented here at this conference I think they're presenting right now. And so unfortunately, like we're here to like break the sad news that you chose the totally wrong workshop. You should be listening to the Chickasaw workshop. They're doing incredible things. They really are. Um, but I think they're recorded, right? So they can 
so people can go back and, and no, I can't get it. Um, all right, all right. So this started out, I think, very kind of so. Um, one of the counties was running a drug court. A lot of the participants were native, um, so the tribe I think initially started providing like transportation services and supportive services, and it was very informal um, and some case management services. They were really there to support the the participants, right? Um, but then that led to a, a memorandum of agreement in 2014 with the county, um, where the services are fully integrated. Um, they have substance use treatments, they have assessment services, they have the list of services you see there. Um, and so I think it's fair to say that um, not only are they a full partner in this drug court, um, they're a driving source. Um, I only want to add that I think um, Chickasaw and their whole model where they really like started developing services and the county and the state like grew dependent on it is so emblematic of the McGirt decision that really uh, that recently came out of and just like oh my gosh it turns out that this is all Indian country and it's like no it's always been Indian country. And the tribes here have always been providing services, both for their tribal members, but also for everyone. And that actually came up in a lot of the briefings for McGirt of like, oh my gosh, if this, if it turns out this is Indian country, like the, the whole parade of horribles. And it was things like Chickasaw Nation's extensive resources that it was like, actually, no, the tribes have extensive capacity and are really carrying the state in a lot of ways. Um, this is not going to be earth shattering. This is already kind of what's happening. Um, uh, this is a great example where the, the tribe kind of came in and like, let us take over. Like, it's, great. it's okay, we've got it. And it's so beautiful. They do such a great job. Uh, we have uh, St. Regis uh, Mohawk, who has kind of three different, we're, well, we're going to highlight three different areas where they, um, where they collaborate closely with different entities. So they have an MOU with Partridge House. Um, a lot of, a lot of tribal members who um, are in the state uh, criminal justice system, um, they go to Partridge House for inpatient treatment. And what St. Regis Mohawk has done is they time entry into their healing to wellness court with the exit out of Partridge House. So there's this seamless kind of flow um, that works really well. And then as part of their supervision, you know, they're in the healing to wellness court and there's a good flow of information that goes back and forth. Um, Franklin County Probation, they're not, I don't think they're a formal member of the healing to wellness team but they do show up at the hearings sometimes and they, they're part of the conversation. So that's a really nice communication flow and, and nice collaboration there. Um, and this last bullet is, is to me exciting. So um, St. Regis is on the international border, right? And so they do a lot of information sharing with the folks up north um, about procedures and about how cases are going and visitation and all of those kinds of things. And so um, it, it just helps everybody serve the families better because of course tribal members are going back and forth across the board. Thanks. So as we are um, out of time, I think we will end with this slide. Um, with co-creation. Um, so we've been sort of building towards all of these collaborations and really, right, the goal is to just get the creative juices flowing. So much of collaboration is dependent upon what your community needs are, what your community, um, you know, practical applications are, and also the extent to which your neighbors are able, willing, and, you know, capable of even conceiving of collaboration. Oh, we have 15 minutes left. Oh, we're going to 1045. Yep. Cool. Okay, cool. Well, then we'll explore some co-creation a little bit. Uh, nothing has changed. Um, though I did put in the um, uh, chat box, if you want to share where you're calling from, I'd love to hear. I know we have some geographic diversity. So that's like, right, the one like nice thing about the fact that we're not all together in the same space right now. But anyways, 
co-creation. So by this, uh, we mean two courts that have come together uh, and like I said in that you know, funding deal, um, have really established a docket that did not exist before and is now going to be uh, a, new, a new creation that both courts have um, developed together. So we're gonna look at a couple of different models. Um, they're really exciting. They're doing like, this is true judicial innovation. I always feel compelled to put an asterisk by these because even though they're really exciting and like, like true innovation, I don't necessarily think they are the answer for all problems. Um, and, and, you know, rounding back to where we started about the concern for uh, collaboration, right, is the infringement potentially on tribal sovereignty. Um, I think that is potentially ripe here. Um, it's also, I think, personality dependent, um, which is true for a lot of our models. And so where one court was created by two judges and it was just magic all the time, in the hands of a different judge, it may not be effective and potentially could cause harm. Um, and so I think that's true for all collaborations. Frankly, that's true for everything that we do. There's lots of examples of the adversarial model causing harm, like no model is immune. Um, but, you know, all right, so there's my asterisk. I think it's nevertheless worth exploring what these co-creation courts have done. Um, I think I'm, I'll, I'll start with Leech Lake, in, also in part because the universe is just crazy. I um, work, there's like a really crummy photo, I apologize, um, but judge, um, uh, Corey Wawasik, who is the woman with the beautiful uh, red stripe going down her judicial robes standing next to the flag. Um, I worked with her extensively during my time at TLPI. Didn't talk to her for like two years. I get this cold email about her. The next day, I serve on a panel with her, which is yesterday. And then today, I get to talk about this, co this court that she helped co-create, like Judge Cora Wawasik, it is her week. She is on fire right now. Um, and for good reason, uh, she is presently a state court judge in Minnesota. Um, before that, she served as a tribal court judge at Leech Lake. Uh, during her time at Leech Lake, um, she discovered a really uh, rampant DUI um, crisis going on in the community. And DUI in particular is ripe to occur in all sorts of jurisdictions. You might have someone that consumed alcohol, you know, on tribal land, but then drove to state land, vice versa, got, you know, consumed alcohol on, at a state bar and then drove onto tribal land. Uh, either way, the crisis was dire. And um, part of it, she realized, you know, her ability to respond to the crisis was at best cut in half because she only had jurisdiction over tribal members on tribal land. So she reached out to her state court counterpart, Judge Smith, who was standing next to her and said like, what if like crazy, we treated all of these cases like they are the same and responded together because between the two of us, we have the jurisdiction to cover all of these people. And between the two of our jurisdictions, we have more resources than we would isolated to respond to this deal. And so um, as she likes to tell it, they started with a handshake and a commitment. Um, they did that for about two years before they bothered to write down a joint powers agreement. Their joint powers agreement, I think, is like a whole page. Um, and so it's not, it's not super extensive. Um, but the idea was, was, at least as far as we can tell, um, completely novel. Um, the idea of two judges simultaneously occupying the bench um, and then ex issuing a joint court order such that, look, we don't have to parse out who has jurisdiction where because we know between these two judges, they have the jurisdiction. Um, boom, they like you, this was the first time we ever saw that. Like from a legal perspective, like, you know, like the first reaction is like, you can't do that. 
Well, I like everyone, it's just stumped everyone where it's like, I guess you can. It's just never been done before. Leech Lake, they first did it in Cass County and then did it again in Itasca County. Do you have anything you wanted to add, Suzanne? Uh, not to this one, no. Okay, cool. Um, so I wanted to put this up ever so briefly to just give an idea of how they actually navigate marrying the two courts. I also think that this is a great example of other types of collaborations that don't quite rise to the level of joint jurisdiction, but have done this step. I've seen courts, especially in Oregon, where you'll have a case start in the state. It's formally transferred to the tribe, but the state probation officer will follow the participant into the tribal court. That's a cool way to do it. Similar with treatment providers, following their patients, depending on what jurisdiction they're in. Um, here, you see that there is a really diverse mix of tribal and state practitioners um, simultaneously staffing a case, um, which I think is pretty neat, right? They're making it up as they go. There's really not like a rhyme or reason for why you would need this particular makeup. You don't, you, right? You need to do what your community needs to move the case forward. And here's what they found to, to be effective. Why don't you do Shingle Springs real quick? Sure. Um, so uh, Shingle Springs is in El Dorado County, which is right over the hill from me, actually. Um, this is really a problem solving court. I mean, if, so I think we have a slide on this. It started out with juveniles. Oh, we don't have a slide. Okay, so it started out with juveniles, you know, catching them early and trying to keep them out of trouble, but then they would recognize that the parents might be struggling with substance use or that, you know, this other issue, you know, there might be some domestic violence issues that are happening with families. So this is another joint jurisdiction court situation where you've got two judges sitting on the bench at the same time. And what they're really trying to do, like I said, it's a problem solving court, right? They just kind of marshal all of the resources that each of them has to try to serve the family best, um, hearing all sorts of different cases that the family might have so they don't have to attend a whole bunch of different court hearings with different judges and different situations and different service providers. It's like a one-stop shop and it's beautiful. I also just wanted to emphasize, like there's so many Zoom meetings now, but Judge um, Christine Williams, who is the chief judge at Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians, just gave a really nice talk yesterday about um, uh, voting and um, the power of like indigenous women doing amazing, amazing things within California. She's definitely a mover and a shaker. Um, but then between her and Judge Kingsbury, who's the judge at Shingle Springs, um, they've talked a lot about, you know, A, how great that this court is, um, court is in providing like meaningful, responsive, holistic services to families, but it has also served as a mechanism to facilitate a conversation that has needed to happen in their communities for a long, long time. Um, this is really... I don't know if it's ground zero, but it's close to ground zero for the uh, genocide that took place in California against California natives. Uh, and the fact that the Miwok Indians are still here today is incredible, but many of the wounds uh, remain and much of the county is um, intentionally, woefully ignorant to much of that history. And uh, relations between the county and the tribe have been, you know, nothing short of hostile um, for an extensive amount of time. And so I think the fact that this joint jurisdiction court exists is a huge deal. It's gonna be a big deal regardless, but it's really fostered a lot of powerful conversation. Nothing's healed yet. Everything is not better, um, but it's moving in a really positive direction. And so I think that th this is an example of the court doing incredible good on a you know, localized level for individual families, but also on a much like higher elevation level um, for the greater community. Um, it's hard to say like where this will go, what the next step is, um, any of that. I just know that like right now in this moment, there is really uh, impactful healing taking place, which is really neat. 
Um, speaking of other jurisdictions where I would say this would never ever work in a million years uh, is Kanaisi in Alaska. Uh, the state of Alaska is like California, nothing short of hostile towards tribal jurisdiction um, for lots of reasons, including in part in response to federal law, like the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. Um, jurisdiction is complicated in Indian country, which doesn't even come close to describing the complexity of jurisdiction that's faced by Alaska Natives. Um, and uh, at, at, I think to completely generalize um, battles that the, the communities have faced for hundreds of years under colonization is that it's been really difficult. Um, and yet the Kanaitse tribe um, developed a really innovative court system partnering with the Kenai uh, court and developed what they had um, called the Hinu Community Wellness Court, another joint jurisdiction court leveraging the authority that the state court has, um, but utilizing tribal services. Um, like all of these joint jurisdiction courts, um, ebbs and flows, um, it you know, took quite a while to get it off the ground. A lot of bureaucracy in part because Alaska operates a centralized system in which everything that each court does as opposed to a county by county, everything needs to go through the central um, state government. Um, which is interesting, um, but it's, I mean, if Alaska can do it, good grief. Now, a funny, not, I don't think, accidental coincidence is that all three of these joint jurisdiction courts have, um, met, you know, organically developed within a PL280 jurisdiction in which the state exercises um, additional jurisdiction that normally the federal government would operate. Like I said, I don't think that's a coincidence. The fact that the um, state government has an outsized role compared to non-PL-280 states, I think has really incentivized, for better or for worse, tribes to reach out to their state parts. It also means that uh, much of the time leading up to these moments, the tribes had much uh, less developed judiciaries because of PL-280. Um, that being said, I know that there has been interest in non-PL-280 states to explore a joint jurisdiction model, including potentially with a federal courthouse, um, sort of replacing that PL-280 that it's like it's the feds that are exercising this jurisdiction. There they were looking at a re-entry court um, targeting tribal members that had been federally prosecuted and were about to be released um, back into the tribal community and had a known substance abuse issue. So I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't quite taken form yet, but the conversation all by itself was interesting, as was the, at least how I identified the willingness of the federal court to like entertain this idea. Um, though I thought I knew bureaucracy and like the feds and the excuses that were coming out of that room about why they weren't gonna be able to make this work were hilarious. Um, so it hasn't been done yet. I don't think it's quite impossible, but the feds were the ones most claiming it was impossible. Okay, hey, uh, Yurok and Hoopa with Humboldt County. This court started with the judges agreeing that the the current child welfare system was not serving their families well and wanting to dream up a different and better way to address um, child welfare cases. Um, and I think it's really key that the, the state court judge, she will get up and that's one of the first things that she will say, the current system doesn't work. We needed to find a different way. Um, so she's been, I think, a really important partner with this. Um, so it's a joint jurisdiction family wellness court um, this is again in California, so it's a public law 280 state. Um, cases that come to the attention of county child welfare, um, when the petition is filed, they are screened and can be um, offered this family wellness court. Um, 
the writ written infrastructure is actually pretty small considering the amount of work that they're doing. Like Leech Lake, they have the joint powers agreement. Again, it's like one and a half pages. Um, I think Hoopa, the tribe um, passed a resolution. Um, and then there's a court manual kind of laying out who does what. But this is a really good example of how all of those reasons we talked about why collaborate, you know, when you've got both court judges, you've got all of the service providers staffing the case and really putting their heads together and thinking about how they can best serve the families. Um, they had this one family they were serving who had never been to ceremony. And um, with much encouragement from the judges, um, the problem with the family attending ceremony is they didn't have the camping equipment they needed to go, right? So uh, with much encouragement, like I said, from the judges, the county agreed to pay for the, the camping equipment um, and the, tri uh, the tribal service providers went shopping with the family and said, okay, you're gonna need this and you're gonna need that. And the family attended ceremony and apparently it was very healing. Um, that's one of the examples of the kinds of things that you can do when you have these kind of, you know, joint jurisdiction court happening. Um, and I'll also say that the way that the tribal court judges can interact with their participants is just very different um, from where, you know, the way because they're community members, right? And so it's very different from where the state court judge um, interacts with the participants. So it's a really nice model about the way they've gone about things. And so we just wanted to share um, some collaboration resources that are actually out there now um, because this is this is a thing that's that's happening out in the world. Um, so there's lots of great resources to draw upon. I'd like to sincerely thank you for joining us today. We hope that this has been helpful. We encourage you to reach out to us and to the Tribal Law and Policy Institute if you have any questions or would like assistance. Um, one of the many great things about TLPI is that they're free. They are available to you to serve your needs whenever you need, you just have to ask. Um, and so with that, um, my sincere gratitude to you and for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Suzanne, for presenting with me. Thank you, Lauren. Always good to talk to you. Yes, thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for attending session E1, Tribal State Collaborations, Transfer Agreements, Joint Jurisdiction Courts, and beyond. After this time, you may find recordings of all enhancement training sessions on enhancementtraining.org. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the training. <laughs>